Well, good morning, Community Heights. Welcome and uh, Merry Christmas. I guess that's the term to use this morning. That was a beautiful singing, beautiful worship. Thank you, worship team. Well, we are in week four of our series in Luke. So let's see. We're going to finish the first chapter of Luke after a month. There's 24 chapters, so it's only going to take 24 months. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a good book. So uh, we're, we're at the end of Luke chapter 1 today, verses 57 through 80. I have with me this morning Robbie Robinson, who is the executive director of Discover Hope 517 Ministries right here in Newton, Iowa. 517, what's the 517? 517, so good morning, I am Robbie Robinson. So 517 comes from 2 Corinthians 517. Ah, ah, new creation. New creation, new life. New life. New so life. Yes. Robbie and I have gotten together several times uh, since I moved here, and we've just had, uh, we've had a blast. We've had a blast <laughs> getting to know each other, and uh, my, my hope is that our church in every way, and, and all the churches in, in uh, Newton in every way can partner with Robbie, and, and with his ministry, with uh, Discover Hope and what they're doing. And uh, I asked him about five or six weeks ago, don't use that line again. <laughs> in the first service, he, well, how did you put it? I asked you five or six weeks ago to join me this morning and Yeah, to get, to get prepared. To get prepared? Yeah, for a section of scripture I had no idea about. And so, oh, Robbie, yeah, so, don't admit it to so, everybody. So, so I've, been, I've been waiting with anticipation <laughs> for this moment. So it's been good. It's been a great preparation for this. Brother, how did it go in the first service? It went awesome. Amen. God was Amen. good. God is good. I, yes. I rest my case. <laughs> so I asked him to join me just so many of you know who Robbie is. Uh, some of you don't. Uh, years ago, he was a part of um, Community Heights. And so for those of you who don't know him, I wanted you to have just an, at least an initial introduction to Robbie and to Discover Hope, uh, as uh, I hope that, that, that Discover Hope discovers they've got a lot more volunteers and support uh, as they seek to do an important ministry in our community in the coming, in the coming months and years. Yes. So, uh, Robbie, in Luke, we found out that um, after that first four verses where Luke clearly lays out what he's doing, he is writing a careful, after careful investigation, he is writing a, a, an account of what Jesus said and did as he was here on the planet. And, uh, he, and Luke, Luke, Luke checked it out. And then Luke starts with, talking about the account of the angel who came and announced the birth or announced the coming birth of uh, John the Baptist. Then the angel last week who came and announced the coming birth of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now this week at the end of Luke chapter one is the actual birth of John the Baptist. Next week in Luke chapter two, it'll be the birth of Jesus that will, and, and Luke lays it out pretty strategically. So John the Baptist and Jesus, and John the Baptist and Jesus. So today we're at the end of the account of John the Baptist's birth, and I'm going to have Robbie pick it up there at verse 57 and just introduce yourself quick to the folks and okay. tell them about your family and oh. things like that. Oh, right. Okay, so yeah, so Robbie Robinson again. I am married to Emily Robinson, which she has blessed me. See, I got this. There's two things up here. I got a pink Bible. Right, so, so all you guys out there, just so you know, it's okay. So, but, so you guys use the NIV version, so and, uh, we use NLT. So my wife took my Bible and I took her Bible. So she blessed me with her Bible. So and it is it did a good job. Not that that matters, but so the, so, tr the truth so, is, I don't know what version they use. So it's just I use the NIV. So <laughs> so I just want to be be eye level with him. And so the second thing is, he got me on this bar stool. Look, that's that's not right. That is, that's just, that's just wrong. This is not ergonomically correct at all. <laughs> yeah. See, but, if, but, but, I, but it gives me eye, eye level with him. We're so, the same height. So he don't think he's above me. He, he but bring why, him. He's why, right here, we're gonna bring him right here. And why, so, but, why, is, why is that though, that when we sit down, we're the same height? That doesn't, that's never made sense to me. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about that, okay. that's right. And so, and so again, we're gonna go into this account of, in Luke, in Luke, in Luke uh, 1, 
57 is kind of where I'm going to start at. I'm going to read just this, just after John is, uh, John the Baptist is born. And so he kind of gave you that little bit of that background, which you guys have been talking about, just leading up to this moment of John kind of being this forerunner for the Savior, right? He's been his forerunner before Jesus' birth. John came and John had the most amazing job ever. Hmm. You know, and so he got to go before Christ to tell people about Christ before Christ even came. So that was awesome. And so we're going to give this little account of just Elizabeth's experience after her son is born and they're getting ready to circumcise him on the eighth day. And this is right before this miraculous thing happened to Zachariah, right? Zachariah, as you remember, he couldn't speak, right? Because he doubted what the angel Gabriel had told him. So God shut his mouth. You can't talk. You ain't going to say nothing. You're not going to tell nobody about none of this. And not that he wasn't able to be able to talk about it, but it was going to bring a full an account of confirmation of what God was going to do in that moment it happened. And so it was going to be another way he was going to know for sure that God meant what he said when he's talking about bringing his, uh, the Savior to save the world. Because see, God made that promise, if we want to go a little bit further back, in Genesis, when the fall happened, God made this promise in Genesis 3.15 immediately when he said, uh, from, from this woman offspring, I'm going to send someone to redeem his people and crush the head hmm. of the serpent, to defeat sin, defeat this slave of sin. And so we get into this, this account where this is about to come true. And so Elizabeth has just had John, so it says in Elizabeth, Luke, Chapter 1, verse 57, if you want to follow along with me, it says, When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And so that was already within itself a miracle that Elizabeth was even pregnant, right? Because she was well past childbearing age. You know, she's way past that. She shouldn't be having kids no more. It's like, that was a done deal. It was out of it. And so, but God, God, God had a whole different plan. So he chose this Elizabeth, who wasn't this uh, really high person back then that culture-wise. Now, her husband, Zachariah, was one of the high priests. But Elizabeth was kind of this lowly lady. And so she got blessed with this opportunity to carry John. And then it says in verse 58, uh, it says, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, his name is to be called John. And see, you can imagine culturally back then that the firstborn son was supposed to be named after his father. Right? And so, Zachariah, they like, he needs to be named after his father, Zachariah. She's like, no. No, it's like she, for once, had a voice. And she spoke up in that voice and said, no, his name is going to be John. This has already been told. His name is going to be John. And so, even though they didn't, but they're like, whatever, lady, you're crazy. It's going to be Zachariah. And so, they needed confirmation from her husband. So, they went straight to wives. You see that? They went straight to the husband to, to try to back them up. And so they went to Zechariah, they said, they called, they called to her, they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. I think, I think that was kind of interesting. We talked about that a little bit, how they made, see, the Bible said that Zechariah couldn't speak, but they made signs to him as if he couldn't hear either. So I just thought that was, you know, it doesn't really go into detail about that, but I thought that was interesting to pick that up, that he, not only he couldn't speak, but evidently he couldn't hear either because they was making these signs and these gestures to get his attention to confirm uh, what, the, what his son's name was going to be. And then he asked for a writing tablet to everyone's establishment. He wrote, his name is John. And immediately his mouth would open, his tongue was loose, and began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be for the Lord's hand is with him? See, Zechariah knew, from verse 19, if you read, Zechariah knew, that Gabriel said, you're going to have a son, you're going to call his name, it's going to be John. He knew already what his son's name was going to be. But yet he could not tell, he could not speak that. So there was this moment of awe when they realized that God has produced a miracle already. So initially they go into this moment of awe about that. 
And Zachariah writes out, name is John, and then boom, he was able to speak. He can even praise God. So, and you made this point too that this has been eight days. This is the eight day of circumcision. So not only was John already born, he still couldn't talk. Not only was the son already here, not only had she already had John, which was a part of that miracle, it still wasn't confirmed until the moment he wrote his name and then he realized at that moment he was filled with the Spirit and given his prophecy of what God had predestined to happen when he was able to praise him. And the first thing he did was give this account of this praise, which we're going to talk about, right? Yeah, and I noticed right at the beginning, it says she gave birth to a son as though, you know, over time, over those months, they had, I mean, they had to wonder, what if it comes out a girl? <laughs> like, they didn't know. So, if it, and, and I'm sure that Zechariah was kind of like, I'm sure it's going to be a boy. I mean, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and then when the boy was born, he still couldn't talk. So, yeah, that, that, that's that is, really interesting. It is interesting because nowadays we get to know instantly. So we just found out, man, my wife and I, we're eight months pregnant. And we're having a girl, a baby oh, girl of mine. Oh, you found out? I uh, know, right? What? Oh. I can't wait. You know, I was like, I want to know. That's cool, though. I was praying for a girl, too. I remember the lady told me that this is the season for boys. I said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, devil. <laughs> we're having a girl, lady. You got to speak that. And, uh, so, but we were. We're having a girl, so I'm excited about that. You have that. girl clothes? We do. I got girl clothes. I got a pink Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, silly me. I know, right? Come of course, on, of course. Me. So, so yeah. it, it also says all the neighbors were filled with awe. Mm. And, and I found it interesting. It's the, same, it's the same wording used in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, where it said that all the people were filled with awe at what the, the signs and wonders that the apostles were performing mm -hmm. there in the early church. So when God is involved, people are filled with awe when God is involved, when God is doing something in people's lives. So in, uh, in verse 67, you've got Zechariah who gets filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies. Now, I'm wondering, since in the last section we saw that Elizabeth, when Mary came to visit, that Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit and then she spoke and said, you know, you're the mother of my Lord. She prophesied. And I'm wondering, has Zechariah been hanging out? Well, well, the baby in the womb gets filled with the Spirit. His wife gets filled with the Spirit. And he's not, he doesn't have any unction, right? Mm -hmm. old, old word from the Spirit. In fact, he can't even, probably can't hear and can't speak. And so now, when he writes his name is John, and then he can talk, after all this time not talking, the Spirit fills him, and then he prophesies. And he prophesies in, in two sections here. The first section is about the Lord. The second section is about his son, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So in verse 68, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He's saying it as though it has already happened. The redemption is complete. It's, it's a done deal when it, in reality, in, in literality, it wasn't yet. He has redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. And in parentheses, at least in my Bible, I don't, there, there, are no, there are no Greek parentheses, but as he said from long ago, this is that idea of fulfillment. Fulfillment. God is fulfilling the promise he made to Abraham a long ago. And all these prophecies that have been stacked up and stacked up and stacked up, all the dominoes are about to fall. And he says, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. Hey, the ancestors lived lives that, that didn't deserve their descendants to get anything good. Right? So God is not giving the descendants what they deserve based on the ancestors' behavior. He's showing mercy to the ancestors. And uh, to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. And there it is. This goes all the way back to Genesis 12. So much in the Bible, okay, kind of all of the Bible, except for the first 11 chapters, goes back to Genesis 12. When God came down and he made that covenant with Abraham, and he said, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Mr. Abraham and Sarah, who have no children, I'm going to make a great nation. And 
one will come from you through whom all the nations on the earth will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus. And it's starting to happen. And Zechariah is prophesying just as his son is first week old. He's prophesying that it's already coming to pass. Uh, to rescue us from the hands of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. By the way, that is a great description of us, of us, that we through Christ can serve God without fear, but with his holiness and his righteousness in us all of our days. See, we're clean, we're forgiven. We stand before God in Christ, but in ourselves too, in our own redeemed selves before God with the righteousness of Jesus, our sin being gone, having been taken by him to the cross. And then the second section of his, uh, of his word here is to his son. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Is that where your church gets its name from? That's the right. way? The way. The way? I am the way. The I, truth. Oh, from that one too. Yeah. It could be from this verse it though. It could be. It's, it's the same. By the way, when he and I were talking on Friday, we were talking about sharing this morning <laughs> and we were both saying how we wanted God's word to be clear and, you know, we, we didn't want to, you know, you know stand before be, as an obstacle to you understanding scripture. And he said, he said to me, I want to get out of the way. No, I'm going, to, I'm going to get out of the way. And I thought, this is a good place to announce that. That he wants to get out of the way. Amen, brother? We know, amen. Tease, tease, tease. Um, so last week he preached at the way. And uh, I said, no way. And so now he's here <laughs> this week to join us uh, in, unity in unity and in love That's and right. in the name of Jesus. That's right. Okay, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender, mer yeah, for, because of the tender mercy of our God. The tender mercy of our God. I love the way he describes that. By which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. By the way, in this passage, last week I told you about the Psalms and the other Old Testament passages that, uh, that Mary quoted in her Magnificat. In this passage, I wrote it down. I looked in between services. There's so many of them. There are um, seven Psalms that he quotes from and 10 other Old Testament passages out of seven different Old Testament books. In, in just his few words here, when the people that heard this understood that what he was speaking, he wasn't creating more Old Testament scripture, but it's, it's straight Old Testament truth. Mm. And it's the Old Testament promises of God that are coming true in the Messiah. To shine, verse 79, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the paths of peace. The Messiah takes people from death to life. From, from death to peace. Guide our feet into the, paths, into the path of peace. So you, my child, will be a prophet of the Most High. Now, none of us, I mean, you don't know, so you, your daughter's not born yet. No. Now, if, we, if, we, if you were to find out that she would be a prophetess of the Most High God to announce the coming of a future Messiah, yeah. that'd be a big deal. Yeah, it'd be awesome. It'd be kind of freak you out, too, a little bit. Yeah, not like Zachariah. I want to tell everybody, though. I don't want to be quiet, though. No, you don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be bad if you ever got struck with that, wouldn't it? it would you? Be, yeah. It would that be would be really bad. You could hardly or live. Or good. Or my wife might be like, yes, finally. <laughs> He's done talking for once. But no. <laughs> the, the, last, the last verse, verse 80, the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Now, when we get on to the next section, the next section we're going to look at is talking about preparation. It's really interesting that John the Baptist lived in the wilderness till he came of age until he was revealed publicly to Israel. Jesus toiled and worked in Nazareth. Remember last week? Nazareth. And 
he was almost 30 when he had a public ministry. Mm -hmm. There's this time of preparation, even for the one who would come and announce the Prince of Peace, Mm -hmm. even for the Prince of Peace. There's a time of preparation. You had a time of preparation. I have. In your life. Yes. I had a time of preparation in my life. So as we've done in the last uh, few weeks, I just want to go quickly through what's it say, what's it mean, how's it affect me, and what's the bottom line. So what's the passage say? We just looked at it. We kind of said it, but number one, Zechariah names his son John, and his speaking was restored. John's no ordinary child. The community marvels that the Lord's hand is with him. They can see that, there's, that God is doing something here first time in 400 years. The restoring of Zechariah's speech symbolizes a new beginning. The beginning of God's fulfillment of his covenant with Israel. It's the era of fulfillment. It's an exciting time. Zechariah's song continues the theme of fulfillment and celebrates God's faithfulness to his covenant people. And Zechariah declares his son John to be a prophet of the Most High God. What's it mean? It means that God is in the process of fulfilling his promises to Abraham and that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through the one whose coming John would announce. That's, again, that's the theme of Scripture. God is in the process of fulfilling his promise to Abraham. But that promise involves us. So I wonder about you this morning. You know, you've come in, and you think you're just coming to church. It's what we do. But God is after you. God wants your heart. He wants you to have his heart. He wants you to know how much he loves you. If you were the only one in this room, Jesus would be here to meet you. Amen. So God wants us. It started with Abraham. He come down, he found one guy. He found Abraham. And he made a one-sided pact with Abraham. And for every person that, like Abraham, places their faith in God, God is fulfilling that promise to Abraham. Your descendants will be more numerous than the stars in the sky. Mm. They'll be out, they'll outnumber the sand of the seashore. How's it affect us, Robbie? How's it affect us? You got this one. How does it affect us and how does it affect me? And so I just think this is, this is I love that, you know, what God ultimately did for us and what he did by sending his Savior Jesus to redeem us back to the kingdom of God. Man, that's something that we can celebrate, right? Amen. That's something we can, we can honestly, as believers, can rejoice about. A lot of times as believers, we like, I don't know. Really, Robbie, it's a lot of pain still. It's a lot of hurt still. But no, no, you've been redeemed to go to the kingdom of heaven on the second coming. That's something we should shout about. That's something we should rejoice about and be ecstatic about because we have to remember what God truly saved us from. What did God truly save you from? You wasn't born this believer already. There was a period and season in your life where you was struggling, fighting, dealing with things, brokenness, hurt, pain, abandonment, all these issues that was going on in your life. And then one day, one day, something grabbed your heart and gave you hope. And you began to receive that hope. You began to investigate that hope you begin to investigate where that hope was coming from, and it begins to transform your life to begin to believe differently about the circumstances and the situation that you were going through, that you can begin to have life and rejoice in that life and have fun in that life. That's what John is talking about. That's what Jesus is going to do. That's what John is preparing a way for. He said, hey, listen, there's someone that's coming that I'm not even worthy to tie his sandal straps. I'm not even worthy. There's someone that's coming that I can baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Spirit. There's someone who is coming who's going to bring you back into unity with the Father in heaven. So when I look at that past, amen, yeah, amen. Praise God for that. I mean, amen. God, that's, that's the God we serve. It's okay, I serve that God, you know, so amen. And so when I look at that, when I think about, like, what does that really do for me and what does that really do for you is hope. It's hope to have in the, in the brokenness 
of your life. It does not matter where you at in life. You have this hope now in Jesus Christ to begin to live this life that is fulfilled. That is fulfilled for the kingdom of God. And then God takes that in you and use it through you to affect and touch other people's lives. That's, that's what it means to me. So, so when I look at what God has called me to do and I look at Discover Hope, it, we're kind of like that John the Baptist per se. We're going out and we're trying to prepare this way for these people who are completely broken and lost. We're trying to set this, this, this atmosphere, this place for them to, to come and be a part of where they can receive this promise, Savior, mm. to redeem their lives from the death that they've been enslaved to for years. We don't get to save them, but we get to bring them into this place where they can begin to see God work and see God transform their lives, to see God heal their brokenness, see God restore their family, see God break the bondage of addiction. So we get to be a part of this miracle. So yeah, we're in this preparation and we begin to be prepared and it takes a village to do that. Hmm. Yeah. That's good, I like that. Um, the, the last thing, the bottom line, my bottom line is going to be, you're going to find out my bottom line is kind of, it's kind of the same bottom line, no matter what the message is. And that is that the kingdom of God has come to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that we're different people and we're living in a new kingdom reality. And our king is Jesus and we follow him. So, you know, it doesn't matter who won you fill in the blank election. You know, it, it doesn't matter because our king is Jesus and he doesn't have a term. Well, he does have a term. It's unlimited, right? And hopefully it's like your data plan. Maybe not. Hopefully it is. Unlimited, right? Unlimited. So, and it doesn't matter what country we're in. You know, we happen to be here in the United States. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It doesn't matter who the leader is, who the king is, who the monarch is, who the dictator might be, who the president, the prime minister. None of that matters when Jesus is the king of the kingdom and you're a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line to the story because this story, it's, it's our story. It's our story. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, this is our story. And Luke writes the story of us. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this thing on, I don't know if it's on Netflix or where it is, the story of us, right? The, the U.S., the United States, and how, how it came. It's, a, it's an amazing documentary series, I, and I love it. But, but this is the story of us. Luke carefully investigated it, and he's writing it down, the story of us. This is our story, and it's your story if you're on your way into the kingdom, if you're saying, God, I don't know, I don't, I don't know about me and you. I don't understand the stuff about me and you. The story is that God wants it to be you and him. He loves you, he wants you, and he wants you as part of the kingdom. So the kingdom is important. Now, you talked about this Discover Hope thing. So he and I have talked, they're in, they're in the process of a, of a relocation deal and uh, getting a new building and, and moving out, moving in somewhere else. So I just wanted him here this morning so at least in the future, in the future, if, if we decide as a body that we want to invest more heavily in what, in what uh, Discover Hope is about, I wanted you at least to have known who Robbie was and what he's doing because they're, they're involved in a lot of stuff. But on your website, you've got like this promo video. Yes. It's a good video, by the way. Oh, thank you. It was a one take, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it was one take and done. I, I had my puppy with me. If you see the camera jump, he hit, he hit the camera. And I, almost, <laughs> I almost said something to the dog, but I had to remember I was still videotaping. So. See, that, that was and good. I, and I said that because that's real. That's, that's who I am. So. Well, even if, if you had to have stopped, you could have gotten a fresh start. So right, yeah. on that video, you talked about a, fr a fresh start Yes, that's part of Discover Hope. Yeah. So tell me what that is. And so our fresh start program is essentially, it's, it's this program that God has allowed me to kind, just to investigate through a lot of trial and error. How do we as believers truly walk with others? How do we truly walk with others? How do we have this mindset as a believer in Jesus Christ to begin to walk with someone else who are isolated or distanced or not a believer or a non-believer? doesn't matter if we, if we can relate to them or if we understand that thinking process from addiction. Because a lot of people 
who don't have empathy for addiction don't understand how to walk with someone in addiction. And so they don't get that language at all. But, but as a believer in Jesus Christ, it does not matter because what you want to be able to do is walk with them in the hope of what God is doing in their life. And so the Fresh Start program was created to see how do I take this individual that comes to our door who don't know Christ, who is broken, whose life is upside down, and then connect them to the faith community. And then we fill in the blank in the middle. How do we take them from here and get them to the faith community? And what I've learned, it takes the faith community to begin to step out of their comfort zone to be a part of these individuals' lives and walk with them. So when they come and discover hope, we, if they want to go deeper, you say, I think I'm through a two-week process because a lot of people ain't serious. You know, so they just, they want a quick fix. You're not going to get a quick fix. And so if they're serious.